Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today, my guest has been on officially today for the third time. I think he's the only guest who's been on for the third time. So there's a there's a lot of stuff we have to cover and set uh, some standards here. You know, it's my pleasure to bring back on the show, Marshall Hugh. What's popping, my brother Blake, <laughs> bro? You did it, man. You're all official and stuff. Yeah. And you just got a thousand followers, am I right? Yes, sir. Bro, I'm proud of you, bro. Thank the you, curls man. look popping, <laughs> hydrated. You're yeah. doing it, bro. Can you believe, like, actually, we've only met under like ten times, but For I real? feel like I feel like we're bonded at this point. Yeah, bro, I feel you're like my we've friend. We've done so many like cool things in this amount of time, and like I've known you for like over two years now. Isn't that it's wild? Two, probably coming up on three, maybe. Oh even. shit, because the yeah. Because we tapped in, what, Splash Fest? It was, I Dude, met you, like, you? right before Emerald City's gala. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like, it's about to be two years. Yeah. And then when that two year hit, then we start working towards our three. Yeah. And wow. I, gave my, I gave my ticket to fucking Nestra last second. I was at, I was like outside the Bruh. gala, and I was like, you know what? Here you go, Nestra. And then I just went home. Wow. So I, I haven't even been to That's one really yet. That's really hurtful, bro. <laughs> 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 he made some cool connects. Though, yeah, so. no, I mean, bro, ever since I seen you come into the scene, your uh, tenacity for this, yeah. your passion for this is so evident. And I didn't even know you weren't 21, dog. <laughs> I was just kicking it with you like you were my friend. And someone told me like, hey, you just turned 21. I'm like, sheesh. There so uh, I'm happy that you're old enough to, to kick with the squad yeah, now, Yeah, that's bro. like the rap life, right? I don't think anyone really cares about it. I, I, I certainly... <laughs> I would have cared maybe, oh. but uh, well, because you're you're like a coach, you know, you gotta lead your yeah. lead by example out here. I am a coach, and we're playing today down Ooh. in Curtis, and we better win, boys. Hell we're seventeens yeah. on the on the squad. What 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 grade do you coach? I'm the uh, second chair uh, for varsity. Ooh. So yeah, no, it's so high school. Yeah, high school. It's not we're not playing no games. Real oh. serious stuff. And so I'm actually the assistant coach to my high school coach. Oh, shit. And it's really cool. You know, he saw me grow up all through, like, the feeder program and all that stuff. So it's, like, almost like I'm coaching with my dad in a weird way, you know? And uh, he really just – I can I can sense when his blood pressure is heading up. Mm. I'd be like, hey, coach, you know, like, you're good. You're good, man. Stay calm. You know, hey, do we have a play to run? We have a play to run? He's like, ah, oh, zipper. And then go and get it handled. So, yeah, it's, coaching is a blessing. It really, mm. like, allows me to uh, feel like I'm a kid again. What made you start doing coaching again? I was broke, man. Yeah. You feel me? Got kicked out the house for being a rapper, and I had to find a way to make money. So oddly enough, I started coaching. I was uh, working at Magnuson Little Kickers, okay, and I was coaching babies. Yeah, eighteen month year old, mostly like expressions, not even a lot of couple, you know, couple two word commands. And they would actually do it. <laughs> you know, they would really jump over, <laughs> jump dot to dot, and go and kick it, um, and into the goal. And I'm like, man, if I can coach soccer, never played soccer in my life. Yeah. Then I can definitely coach basketball. So my old coach, Donald Watts, um, who's also been a big mentor to me, son to Slick Watts, and now his son's dominating out here in uh, West Coast or in uh, Metro League basketball. He was like, bruh, you, you're coaching soccer? Like, you don't even play soccer. Come over here, train with me. Yeah. So I started training there, and then I started just coaching teams and played uh, with the Storm. I was a practice player. I used to get beat up, elbowed by Brianna Stewart and stuff. Damn. Still, yeah, I still owe you one for that, family. <laughs> And, um, yeah, basketball has taken me around the world and around the States. So you actually got kicked out of your house for being a rapper? Yeah, I feel I like your family's, like, supportive. I of know. They just weren't at that time. They didn't see it. And to be fair, I okay. will say this. I was new to rapping, you know? I just started in, like, right freshman year of college actually taking it seriously. What year was that, would you say? Uh, I was, like, 19. Okay. Yeah, uh, 2013 or something like that. Jesus, wait, how old are you again? Yeah, I'm like 28, bro. Oh my god, yeah, that's bro. craziness. You didn't know that. No, man, I got a youthful soul, bro. I really, <laughs> I really do this. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll, I live forever inside of my like heart and soul. That's really where. So, but I got started lately, late. Yeah. So I'm like, I come back. My parents, uh, they're so used to me being an athlete. I'm at Carnegie Mellon, like really good school. I come back, they're just like, what? Are you? I'm rapping like 2 chains, Lil Wayne, like party raps, you know? Me and my bros. We wait, got... wait, do you say like, I can't imagine you saying like, pussy popping. Yeah, no, you I say, mean. Can you say it? Let me hear bro, that on the podcast. Oh, absolutely not, Blake. <laughs> boy, you know I'm media trained. You, out your mind think you're going to get that out of me on this thing, bro. Heck no. You but, that, were you that type no, of music? No, I was reckless. I wow. was reckless. I and can't you know, even see um, that. the dude who's the host for the uh, Kraken now, McLaren. Okay. He, uh, he was the host of my very first show. 
paid four hundred dollars to perform at DXC. I remember uh, Ill Chris was there. Eighty Four Fly was headlining. I think Nacho was playing too. Paid four hundred dollars. They had us go on first. It's oh. like one p.m. Dog. Everyone's just calm as heck. We go on the stage. We're yelling "F this, da, da, wild You know, we don't give up. We don't give up. Uh. You know. Hey, they were just staring at us, dude. And it was crickets. We finished crickets, bro. Mm. And even my dad, Randy, was there. Boy, just, I'm like, come on, Bobs. You're not even going to clap for me, bro. This is disrespectful. Uh, but the host, who is the same exact guy who hosted Kraken now and was at the Neptune show and stuff, hell yeah. he was like, bro, y'all got the energy. They just weren't ready for that. Like, keep going. Like, don't trip. Keep going. You got the energy. And, like, that meant more to me than anything I could ever have felt in that moment because I got some encouragement after just having like the biggest rejection, wasting money, pay to play. Yeah. And then it was just such a full circle moment the other day at the Neptune. Like he stayed after, like gave me the hug and stuff. And was just like, man, I see your journey, bro. And I'm like, you are for one fact that knows like where I started from to where I am today. Like I already, I'm playing with house money, bro. I already, mm -hmm. I did what I set out and left college to do. And that was to make an impact. So, I oh, mean, I could go today, family. Yeah. I could go today, man. I feel so good, Blake. Woo! Come on, <laughs> bro. Hard work, bro. Wait, so did you create it? Like, I was talking to Greg Cipher on the previous podcast episode. That's the man. Yeah. You gotta. Yeah, you should have him on every podcast. Dude, he's wild. That yeah, was... I love it. I love it. It doesn't and take much to get it. <laughs> flow together. Oh, great stuff. So we were talking about, like, how we feel that, starting in 2022 at least, that there shouldn't be like any more all rap shows. Like even when I was at Mojams, I was like, when I saw Shamel, I am Shamel at um, Substation, and then saw her at Mojams, I felt like her performance just went up a notch. Like just being with like a band. Do you feel like was that like purposeful? Like what was your mindset when you created a band as a hip hop artist? Were you noticing that it was like a Seattle? The Seattle is more based around. Yeah, Bands? I mean, you got to look around. Seattle is a band city. Yeah. And if you're not a band city, you got to realize, okay, yes, the band and the music is one thing, but what also does a band bring with you? A team and manpower, woman power, human power centered around a common goal. So if you're not going to have a band, you better have a team of six people that are all at least semi-aware of what's going and pushing it towards something. Right. So it's really hard just number-wise for a person with a one or two person, three person team to, okay, I'm going to drum up the same amount of excitement about this show or energy in this room as a person with 14 people coming to the stage, you know? Yeah. So for example, last night, it was an all rap show. But I'm Timber Room at the Timber Room. Shout, Shout out, Liz. It was pop in there. Oh, you really? know Liz? Yeah, I just had her on the podcast. No way. Yeah. I'm sorry. I feel like I, I I'll be busy, bro. <laughs> no worries. I got the Scythe one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so Liz like put together show and she reached out to me. I was like, "Are you on this bill with Lobes? You know, he's saying, but I'm like, absolutely. You know, let's do this. Yeah. And I invited probably ten rappers out. Eight of them pulled up. And we were just swapping set after set, song after song, feature after feature, and like keeping the energy high. Yeah. And that wasn't a lively, it didn't feel like a Seattle hip hop show. It felt like phones out, people really gripping on every single word. And I think you just have to create the environment and have the team that's locked in on, on like a cohesive theme and a goal that you're headed towards. So that's number one. But for me personally, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. I came back, dropped out of school, got kicked out the house had to move into like one of those spots where you don't know anybody. It was me and my bro, Raul, who I shot out in that song, Cleos, who ended up, he's a doctor right now. He was like my, my best friend. So when I dropped out, everyone was like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> Everybody, you know? And who was just like, no, bro. Like, just if you're going to do it, bro, do it. Like, I got your back. So yeah. he's the one who set me up with the little kicker's job. Anyway, me and him move into a random apartment with six people. Okay. And so we're just rapping, bro. I'm, in, I'm literally making songs and like rapping in my closet getting them going trying to put them out drop the song yoga pants okay if you can find yoga pants bro then you're really good at your job and that <laughs> will have give you something to laugh about bro because if people really know me they know we used to throw yoga pants parties in this uh, oh, apartment shit. that we uh rented out the pet house on uh 18th and 45th you feel me greek row right there oh and so it was me Hool, and then six other random people one dude was like 63, dude named John, Polish dude, never came out of his room. We'd be partying <laughs> four in the morning. He'd just stay in his room. What the fuck? I know, heck of, weird, heck of weird, bro. But what was I supposed to do, bro? I had to live somewhere. <laughs> and then the other homie was Fozzie and his cousin Mecca was sleeping on his floor. So uh -huh. we got to have seven. And then uh, one of them was this guy, Marty. Uh -huh. 
Okay. And I didn't even know he played the sax or anything. We yeah, just yeah, party yeah. and kicked it for a whole Metal year. Metal Marty, right? Exactly. Metal, Metal Marty, Marty, my saxophone player. So once I got kicked out of that spot, I was interning at Cube 93, and uh, Marty hits me. He's like, hey, Marshall, my band, we're jamming over here at Dante's. Uh, you should come and play with us. I'm like, bro, you got a band? Like, I didn't even know. I'd just been hanging out with him for a whole year. So it fell into your lap then versus- Literally, I just came to it, and then I ripped- and I was like, oh, we and I could see the crowd's response. I could see how people like were reacting to what was going on. And I'm like, oh, this is it. Mm. And then I literally fell off the face of the earth for a year and a half. And I like just Kanye. was reading books <laughs> and I was studying the hero's journey. And I was reading uh, Dante's Inferno, Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, I read The Odyssey. I read uh, 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 so many books, bro. Really, so many books, bro. Are you still a reader? I am. I'm, I switched more to like an audio book. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my sister's actually an author, so I've been reading her books. Well, you have siblings? I got two older sisters that are real. That's why everyone, oh, okay. when I dropped out of school, they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, we already, we've already laid the foundation for you, bro. Just make it through. You're going to yeah. be good, you know? And so, uh, yeah, I got two older sisters. One is an author, and um, the other one is in education. Okay. And so she's getting her PhD right now at Stanford, doing her thug dizzle, baby. Damn. Whole family going crazy on them. Yeah. Whole family going crazy on them, Blake. There we go. Lineage, family. <laughs> Lineage, man. They don't just pop up, bro. So uh, anyway, that's how the band got started. I just, it just right. fell right into uh, my lap, and then I fell off for a year and a half, created the hero's journey in the hip opera. And that's how we came back on the scene. And that was like late uh, 2017. And then we haven't stopped since. So do you think there's like an audience for hip hop in Seattle though? Or like when I when I go to hip hop shows, it does seem like most of the people are either artists mm -hmm. and then the people that aren't artists are like siblings. Not siblings, not why is siblings? <laughs> really? A lot of I mean, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean like they're like they're like partners or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, there's a lot to be developed without a doubt. The fact of the matter is there are people here, but whatever we're currently doing is not getting them to come out of their house in the way that we need them to in order for us to make the type of money we need to for this scene to be sustainable for years and years in it and artists to get the type of shine and notoriety that they deserve. Right. That's a fact. But I'm the type of person like, okay, that's a fact. Is it give up season? Is it as To me, it was a just season. Yeah. But again, rooms like Mojams, that Mojams room was... Rooms like last night were some of these shows, Funk's Giving, like the energy is there. It has to be harnessed and it has to be coordinated and it's going to take a communal effort to raise. Again, like we're in Seattle. It's as far as you can get away from all these other states. People don't yeah. just come here. It's not Austin. It's not a destination spot. Really, what can it come here? And then it's rainy when you get here. Yeah. And what, you got to go to a show, then you got to take your coat off and then the people aren't really dancing the same way as the whole rest of the country. Right. We got some things stacked up against us. What about Bumper Shooter or something? Do you think, or Capitol Hill Park, do you think people come from out of town to visit that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I don't maybe, know. Maybe a couple, maybe like 2,000, 3,000 or something like that. But to me, that kind of feels like local. Yeah. When I, when I went to them or I've only gone to one Capitol Hill Block party, um, but I'll go again. Yeah. They let me play. And then bumper shoot, same thing. Cuddy put me on the stage. I'll be there bringing the vibes to the people. You put me in there, it'll be fun, man. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out this music scene out here. Like Blake, Blake, <laughs> Blake. You've talked to 300 <laughs> artists, bro. Yeah, it's What you still... got to do and what everybody got to do is they got to get on their grind and control the things they can control and do the best they can and really turn this thing up. Yeah. And be when you think of... A artist and something that magnetizes people to a scene. What are some of those characteristics and attributes of an artist? For like, I think a for like an actual audience to show up, you have to be like genuine. Okay, you know, like I think there are a lot of hip hop artists and even bands that sound too much like other bands that do it way better. Okay, you and know? then what about the what about like does aesthetic play into it? A hundred percent. It does, huh? Like you like when you had the when you had the Neptune thing, like you had dancers on stage, you guys were in costumes. I think that's uh and you were able to pull a big audience on a fucking Thanksgiving evening. Not th Thanksgiving Eve. Yeah. You know, so like actually like that's a big thing I'm hearing from because I want to start doing my own shows. Like the biggest thing is people saying you have to have like an aesthetic that people want to. Yeah, you show gotta be to. charismatic, man. You gotta look the part. You gotta talk the part. You gotta act the part. Yeah. A lot of the things that we have going on in the scene, 
if we're being honest with ourselves because of all the hurdles we have to get over to, because we have to work nine to fives, because we're not getting paid properly, we're not able to really expose our inner selves up there on that stage. A lot of people are in their own head. You can tell they're in their own head while they're performing. A lot of people can't breathe yeah. while they're performing. That's not a knock. It's a reality. A lot of people aren't something that you look on the stage and you're like, whoa, that's a superstar. And that's a skill set. It has to be developed. It has to be mined. It's some Bitcoin. We got the Bitcoin <laughs> over here, buddy. Dogecoin, MLB. Take it. Are you gonna make it L take it. MLB coin? Absolutely. Dude. I'm making it all, man. Come on. There's no breaks. There's no breaks. We really you gotta you gotta want this. And you got if you're not being given it, you can't look around other people. Hey, I deserve this. Hey, this person this happened to me. What are you gonna do about it? Right. What are you gonna do about it? Rise to the occasion. I got a basketball game early later, you know what I'm saying? So I'm already in coach mode. If one of my players come over to me talking about, hey, the ref did this and the, the environment is bad. I'm going to say, hey, bro, what are you going to do about it? Get in a stance. Yeah. Get in the passing lane. Go get an offensive rebound. Hustle it. Really hustle it. And if we have 200 people hustling like Shayna Shepard, hustling like Eva Walker, hustling like Teddy Talks, we're going to be fine. Are you Teddy Talks? That's me, buddy. Talk to him. <laughs> Tell me about this fucking, uh, what is it with this like language you've created? With, like, the, <laughs> the fucking the heme schemes, my buddy. <laughs> She's your tins. They're literative. What is that? What is that? Man, honest, <laughs> to be honest, I've been talking like this probably since eighth grade. Uh, oh. <laughs> Olski Woski. We used to go, who do you hit him with the Olski Woski? And then when I went to O'Day, which is, I, you know O'Day is. I know O'Day. Yeah, so it's like when we were around those guys, that's when the Ertens came in, you know? Everybody's just in class, oh, Sheeshertens or, uh, you know, pass me the pencil tins. I'm like, what? You know? And so I already had the Oski Woski going, so I brought the Oski Woski to my O'Day bros. Okay. They brought the Ertens to me, and then when I went back to Jackson my senior year, my bro, Brett Kingma, look him up, put some of his highlights right here, he used to give people fits. I seen him give Tony Roden a 40 burger. That's a fact. That's a 40 me? burger? You don't know what a 40 burger tins is? Come on bro it's a, when you score 40 points with a dijon mustard on it pulling up from half court my boy bk okay so bk <laughs> he used to he used to shoot a jumper and before he let it go he said got him <laughs> and before he even let it go shoot it from deep talking about got him and yeah. that's when the heme started and the heme is just anything person place thing <laughs> noun verb adjective it's what you do you know so pass me the heme are we trying to make this like a Northwest thing though? Like when I, I have like Chicago artists on and like mm -hmm. my, this interview isn't out yet, but I had this guy on named Femdot and mm -hmm. I was, he has a song called Bussin', which is like his biggest song. Like, right on. I was like, what the fuck does Bussin' mean? And he went like down a whole fucking rabbit hole. Really? Like how that's like part of the Seattle, I mean the Chicago culture. Like Bussin'. Are, are you trying to make like, the, man, I'm just, doing my, I'm just having fun, family. <laughs> you know, people try to take things so seriously. <laughs> it's hard out here, bro. I'm trying to bring some levity to the situation. I always talk crazy, flamboyant, add my own sauce on everything. It's the Drippertons, man. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, I just, that's my thing. If other people want to do it and get on it or, you know, put their own flavor on it, by all means, you know. And I encourage everybody to get with the lingo. We are absolutely just expressing ourselves. And it feels good, man. You can't cheat the hemes. Are you just finding your aesthetic right now, though? Like, seems like you, you had braids. I did now a lot. you and then you've like started dyeing your hair, but it yeah. seems like it's more of a more of a recent thing. Is this yeah, like I mean before, bro, I wasn't like I had to go do some corporate stuff. I had to go oh, work. Yeah. Okay. And then the minute I said, yo, because here's what happened. Right before we were gonna go on our national tour, our first national tour, I still look clean cut and whatnot. Cause I'm like, damn, am I gonna be a coach? I don't know. All these outside pressures are telling me like Marshall, you can't dye your hair or, you know, you can't walk around with rings or, you know, have a, a Fred, Freedom Dread, you know, the Ted Dread. How does that even, how do you even do that? What, get the Fred? Yeah. I had it from the Poor Man Rich Soul video when I had the, the braids. Yeah. And then I just left this one in. Uh, shout out um, my boy Art. I was just with him the other night. Uh, he was the first person I seen do this maybe like four years ago or something at the Sea Monster. I ran into my boy Art. I was literally with him last night. And he had uh, a Fred. Oh, so she so you went to the place with like the carpet on the stage. Uh, there's a lot of places like that, buddy. Really? Yeah. I was. And that's the worst thing to have on stage because you don't know what type of juices are dropping on that thing, man. That's oh. a grimy carpet, guaranteed. You need a fucking carpet cleaner. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that, where are we gonna find the budget for that? You know? No, I'm just. No, I really. I've been. I've been realizing like I. Like it makes sense, but I never really 
take a step back and realize how broke artists We're are. We're broke. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, a lot of people, they that's how they choose to carry themselves. And maybe that is their reality of like, okay, I got the money, so I don't need to be in the club every night working. Yeah. I know me. You got $250 for me, I will be there, Cuddy. <laughs> Give me $250, I'll do whatever. I'll host, I'll help clean up afterwards, whatever it is, because that's the reality of my situation right now. Music does not pay in the way that you need it to unless you can accumulate people and you can move product and move merch yeah. and move units ticket sales after you split it with the whole bill and you only got 60 or so percent to start with and you're not getting part of the bar you're not finna make no money man yeah. it's not gonna happen you might make you know the most i ever walked home with as like marshall hugh walking home after throwing a, a festival or something like that 450 dollars you know, and that's getting everybody paid out, this, this, and that. That's I'll, my car insurance. <laughs> hey, yeah, it is. Okay, talk that. Talk to him. Okay, Blake. Yeah. Exactly, bro. So, you know, that's why I'd be knocking out three features a week. That's why I'd be at three shows a week. That's why I'd be emailing, DMing, asking for sponsorships, connecting, hustling, networking. Because to really make this thing a reality in this infrastructure we have here, you better get on your grind, family. You better go get it, dog. But do you think you've been like working like this since the very beginning of you be joining the music scene, or is this no. like? No, I mean it's gradual. The more and more you get affirmations to keep going, the more and more like you know. Today we were talking to the Seattle Met. It's like, whoa, that's a big platform, you know. Wait, what's an explain like what's an affirmation for you though? Like, so for me, I've had a couple ones that were more like spiritual, and I could dive into those because those are like more intense and like body, uh, like visceral experiences but as far as like the music shows goes like all right cool i did the hip opera when i did the hip opera i did two show nights i invited 20 different uh artists to be a part of it they showed up back to back nights we all did it together we all came together and i think we sold like 400 tickets and we were able to donate like a thousand dollars to charity that's like okay hey this is realistic i can do that yeah then when no other shows came i said okay Let's make this thing Culture Fest, teamed up with a bunch of different artists and collectives, and then booked Martial Law Band. And so people were running around to me like, hey, bro, this is a sick gig, man. Like, how'd you get this gig? I'm like, mm, yeah, right. I don't know. I had to create the opportunity. But once it was successful, then it's like, okay, good, keep going. And then you play your first Numo show or something. That used to be the indicator and the marker. For me, now what I would, after living through it and trying to use external ways to validate my own art, I would look on what type of impact you're having with your desired market and the people you love. And if people are gravitating towards what you're doing, if you're doing that, that's affirmation enough. You don't need an Emerald city gala or a splash fest or a Fremont Friday to feel like you're seen or heard in the community. At the end of the day, you, if you are impacting and touching people's lives, you're doing your job and that's, the impact's more to focus on. Do you think you have a solid audience now, though, or do you feel like you've, like, oversaturated yourself? Because you do play a lot. Do you think I that, feel like... like it's better than ever, bro. Like, you see me, bro. I'll be at the parties taking pictures, family. I'll literally be walking around, hey, Marshall, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, my goodness, you know, especially after Neptune. I mean, look, bro, never stop. Every single one for those Fremont Fridays, yeah. packed out. Then we went to Numo's, packed that thing out. Neptune, you seen the crowd. You seen what was going on. So... I think you got to hit it hard. You got to hit the circuit hard because there's people out there that have never seen me before. And then the people that have seen, they're starting to notice subtle different changes in the set. My pronunciation coming out differently on this song. And so they're coming back. Oh, I really liked how you played Poor Man Rich Soul today. And we're building like Grateful Dead cult like following. It's all what people are trying to accomplish. And, you know, I'm trying to get people that are ride or die. But do you recommend that for other artists or do you think that can't do it? Because I know a lot of artists do worry about like the oversaturation. So for me, you know, I went when I went down to L.A., shout out my boy Joshy, shout out my boy Leon Knight. On Tuesday, he's in a studio session, then he goes to DJ. Wednesday, he has a residency, sleeps in, parties with the homies. Thursday, in a studio session, goes and plays again. Like in other scenes, the musicians that aren't typically on on, they're hitting the beat. Mm. They're out every single night that they can and they're exposing themselves and they're sharpening their swords. So for me, I want to do this my whole life. And the reality is if I start touring 
in the way I kind of already am. But if I start changing to where it's like, okay, I was outside the city for five months last year. I want to be outside the city for probably seven months out the year or something like that. Come back for summer, be here intermittently, come back for December and do our December to remember and our drive with Cozy Connections. If I'm going to be doing that, means I've got to be playing every night. Hmm. How am I going to get used to playing every single night and being on tour every single night if I'm not really doing it? It's not going to happen. So my goal, it just depends on what your goal is. If you want to take over the local scene, maybe for some people it's better to be strategic and go quarterly events, annual events, biannually events. For me personally, because of the type of stamina I'm trying to build and the consistency I'm trying to build and the type of energy I'm trying to put out into the world, I got to get revved up to be able to do it every single day, bro. So you're not worried about the local scene really then at this point? I mean, and what do you mean in what sense? I got a lot of friends here, so right, I want it to like, be successful. But if you're saying you don't care about like the oversaturation because you're thinking about going on tour, that's different than someone who wants to like just be known. Yeah, or and thinking, I, don't, I, I don't like that word oversaturation, bro. Okay. You know, because it's, it's like- a one set, That's a newer word I've learned, oh, so okay, I feel like nice. I'm trying to use it. <laughs> yeah, well, you're a, a media person. You don't want things to be saturated, oversaturated. You know, I mean, for me, it just depends. Right. If you don't, if you can't make one of my shows, then don't come. That's okay. That's love. You know, if you're tired, of, you say, oh, I've already seen MLB three times this month. I'm not, I don't really want to go. That's fine, but you're going to miss some wild stuff. Yeah. You're going to miss uh, Jimmy James ripping on the guitar. You're going to miss Eva Walker playing with us. You're going to miss Chris King on the harmonica. You might miss me popping out in a wedding dress paying homage to Kurt Cobain. Yeah, tell me you about me? that. Tell me about the, oh, the Kurt yeah, Cobain man. at the Neptune. So we, we played a Nirvana cover, and it was just one of those moments where it was like, bro, I'm really married to the game, family. This is for life, not taking it off. And so the wedding dress was inspired because Kurt Cobain did it on Saturday Night Live. And when I saw that, I'm like, what would Kurt do the first time he got to be on this Neptune stage? Like, I'm really living a moment that the people I idolize, it was a stepping stone in their journey. And how do I embrace that and fully, like, get out of my mind and just say, bro, this is it. Like, I'm married to the game. I'll let everybody know right now. I'm real deal, rock star, wear whatever I want, how I want, and look good while doing it. And so I came out there in the wedding dress. You should have seen Matt's first face when I was in the house because we have this spot that we go to get our stuff from. Yeah. They were all just like, uh, OG oh, Mambo and stuff. His face is like, oh, what are you doing, you know? But, you know, I just, I'm married to the game, man. It's real deal. And people uh, that I idolize are the people that push these type of boundaries uh, in fashion, in music, and in society. And that was just, you know, my way of doing that in that moment. Mm -hmm. So are you pushing more of the band? Or do you, because you've been doing, like, you've just started recently releasing a newer, like, solo projects, or you released a project with Pompeii. Mm -hmm. So, like, are you trying to get back into being, like, more of a solo artist as well? We're doing it all, you know? I mean, again, it comes down to money and logistics. Right. You got to think about it. Everywhere we pull up, how many people pull up at the MLB everywhere we go, bro? Depends, right? What, what you got to estimate? I have no idea. You're lying, bro. I don't. Is it 10 it's or less? It's more than 10, Okay, for sure. that's why you got to give okay. me a ballpark, buddy. There Help me out here. No, all I'm saying is that you, if I want to go to Europe or something, right. or I want to go to Austin, uh, unless I'm filling out massive places and, these, and I'm able to move a large amount of product, you're looking at a losing endeavor bringing all those people mm. so me i can go out or maybe matt and i can go out we can lay foundation we can create connections i can get on other band sets i can do solo sets i can network go and meet people and then once we have a contingency of a hundred or so people in that city that are really ready for mlb and the energy that we bring to that specific location like we just did in anchorage like It'll now make sense to go back up to Anchorage with the whole band, but it wouldn't have made sense for all of us to go originally. We would have just lost $3,000 or something. Yeah. You know? So I'm just trying to be able to be as flexible and as mobile as possible and understanding that this is my moment. This is my window. I got to grind and I got to get out to the places where making money off of this and being able to sustain this and t create avenues for other artists to do the same from our region is out there. And I got to be able to be as flexible as possible so are you do you feel accepted in like both the band community and hip-hop community or Absolutely. Is, is there more acceptance in one field than the other i mean it's different you know the thing is with the band community and this is something that probably the hip-hop community could learn from but also there's a reason why competition is ingrained in the fabric of hip-hop just like basketball yeah. when i go out if i again i look at it like coaching if I go and one of my players are just joking around with the other team before a game type thing, and I'm like, bro, what are you doing? But if it's an all-star game, 
then, okay, I can maybe have a little more leniency towards that, you know? So it depends on the way the environment is set up. So I respect the competitive edge that comes with hip hop and I love it, you know? I actually, you know, despite all the, what people might think, like, I love competition. It makes me like, brings the best out of me. And I know it's bringing the best out of other people. So I let's go, you know, let's keep that up. That's good energy to have, you know, it's, it's all fun and games over here. You know, it's all love on my end. So it is what it is. But on the band side of things, the first time I went to Mojams, I saw this nasty bass player, boom, 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 doing his thing. And I'm like, Ooh, wee, that guy's oh, might be as good as Evan. And then I saw, as soon as he got off stage, Evan, a.k.a. Big Pink, my bass player, shout out Elric Basses, he goes straight over to the guy and he's like, oh, what you were playing was so heavy, man. You're so sick, blah, blah, blah. And I'm half want to go over there and snatch him like, bro, what are mm. you doing, bro? That's not, He's not in our band. But then I started seeing that's how everybody was treating each other. And they were celebrating each other's wins. And they were celebrating each other's uh, proficiency. And they're uplifting each other and sharing trades of the secret uh, or uh Secrets of the trade, and they're in each other's bands too. Which and, is yeah, kind of crazy. and these guys all play in nine different bands and stuff. You know, that was yeah. another thing I had to get over. I'm like, oh, they're in so many projects. It's like you got to be, and they encourage me to do the same thing. So I feel super accepted in the band sphere because I'm unique over there. There's not a lot of people that are really out there, and and I'd be really hitting the scene. Yeah, you know, I'd be really shaking hands and looking at people in their face and meeting them, knowing about their family, meeting their significant other and stuff. So. I'm legit friends with a lot of the people in the band scene because that's just the environment. Yeah. The hip hop scene around me is starting to be like that too. And it's starting to rub off and we're realizing it. But at the same time, there's always going to be a gritty element of competition. And that's just where, where in what city is it not? Right. You feel me? But do you feel like you get criticized more than other artists in Seattle when it comes to hip hop at least? Bro, I really be out here, you know, I, I'm not the type to take days off. I'm in people's face constantly and I am the type of person I know it's about myself. I'm polarizing. You got to pick up. I said in songs, it's that time to choose a side. And if people don't want to rock with me or whatever, and they want, that's their prerogative family. I'd rather have people actually have a reaction to me than just, Oh, neutral. Hey, there's Marshall. Hmm. Oh, there's no, oh, Hey, Hey man. And then not, you know, not think, not care. The fact that people are passionate on either side, more power to them. All I can do is live my life, you know? And, I grown through that. It made me stronger of a person. It makes me understand my purpose more. It makes me understand how to refine my message better. And I look forward to being challenged, not just regionally. I want to be challenged nationally. I want yeah. the top dogs mad at me. I want the energy, you know, because I'm really built for this. I'm really an everyday guy. Work out every day. Eat healthy every day. Oh, Sherry, sure. you one of those vegan guys? I am one of those oh, vegan God. guys. I'm a reductionist, though. Shout out uh, Wilson, like the volleyball, the homie Wilson. They put me on that term. <laughs> Wilson! Uh, Wilson, exactly. <laughs> that's where they get it from. But yeah, they put me on that uh, term. I'm a reductionist. Okay. So I try to eat all vegan. Uh, but, you know, when I went to like Austin, I did try some brisket, family. <laughs> yeah. I had to. I had to see what it was talking about. When I went up to Alaska, I had to try some king crab and some halibut. You feel me? Thanksgiving, I'm going I'm to eat a little bit of turkey, but I'm going to try to just reduce when I can, how I can. I'm not going to beat myself up over it if I make a mistake. So I am a vegan, but not like the when you said, it, oh, one of those vegan guys. There's some cool vegans out here, dog. Real shout out my boy, Plant Based, uh, Skatey P the God. He's the one who put me on being vegan, man. Uh, Skatey P, I was up there in Alaska Anchorage with him and Lamont and Payday and... Uh, Riker, all the homies, you know, but uh, Skatey P is the one who put me on being vegan. But you're doing it correctly, at least, because I know there's like a lot of people who say they're vegan and they can still be like unhealthy. There's, there's you know? no, well, hey, look, I'm not perfect. Right. You feel me? I, I, <laughs> I shit I'd on be, vegans. I'd be, I'd be <laughs> eating bad vegan food. I'd be drinking beers. Yeah. I'd be cussing when I'm not supposed to, you know what I mean? But I'm trying my best. And I don't try to hold myself to such a unrealistic standard that. I let myself down and then it crumbles my like self image. I am, but a, a person. I am a mere mortal. I'm a, for real, you know? And you know, when you're in the public eye, people will treat you like you're not above growth or you're not above learning in real time. These past two years been insane. <laughs> so much like things swirling around me. I don't even like fireworks anymore from the flashbangs from the protest. Like that's real life stuff. Yeah. Wake up. <gasps> I'm like, dang, bro, I'm low-key messed up off all this stuff happening around me. And I still got to go out and, and 
execute my passion and my dream because that's the type of standard I want to set for myself and the people around me is to succeed and to bring your full self despite the difficulties that you go through behind and in front of the scenes, you know? I'll be going through it like the rest of us. Yeah. I want to I want to touch on the after effects of Chop. But before that, yeah. you, made a, you made a point about um, touching on like the, the top dogs, you know? Mm. I want to hear your uh, how you felt the reaction was towards the the Macklemore diss. Uh, what do you mean? You know the song you put out, Jake. The digital. Oh, that wasn't no diss. What? That that's definitely not came a off dog. as a. <laughs> that's that. That's that kicking down the door with no help from Macklemore. <laughs> I heard a lot of people thought took it as a diss. That's what I'm, bro. That's what I'm saying. Literally, I said nothing, no disrespectful to anybody. In fact, I shouted people out and showed them love. I said, Travis, get respect. How, how is that a diss? But you I mean, me? you've heard that at least. I have. People are like, oh, you are oh, you came for, you know, people in Seattle, it's funny, they know Mac, like, oh, you came for Ben, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, I did not. I told my authentic truth on the mic, and that's what's so funny. I'm not talking about uh, shooting people. I'm not talking about beating people up. I'm not talking about anything that's expletive. I'm over here just speaking my truth. I'm out here doing TED Talks without Macklemore ever helping me once. That's not disrespectful. Right. There are people who get his help. Good for them. And they earned his help. And it, he doesn't owe me any help. That's another thing everybody got to understand. Macklemore don't owe me nothing. He did this thing himself, man. Yeah, people helped him, sure. But he woke up every day. He went on national, international tours. He created the residency. He put people in positions to succeed. That's all he has to do. He's not obligated. If he he maybe could do more, I don't know him like that. Right. Maybe he could do more. Maybe if I was in a situation, I would do things differently. But he's not owed to do anything for me. But I'm not owed to not speak my truth on the microphone. Right. You feel me? Right. And so that to me, I I was like, bro, people think I'm dissing Cuddy. Like I look up to him. I wore the same uh, Matador jacket that he wore in his video. I wore it at Thanksgiving, the exact same one. Not like. A copy of it, the exact jacket he wore. I was wearing that as an ode to him. Wait, how'd you get that? <laughs> Come on, cause I'm really be talking my talk, buddy, with Ted. Uh -huh. You feel me? And so that's funny, man. I didn't even. That's just that's just funny to me. No, I. Hey, shout out Macklemore, bro. We're all about clearing the air in this space. Yeah, man. I mean, something tells me Macklemore was very unbothered. By <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, shout out him. Shout out everybody who he has helped and. Good, good for us, bro. We're all yeah. trying to get to the same point, you know. Do you think he's even like a gatekeeper in Seattle? Do you think there are gatekeepers in Seattle when it comes to like <sighs> making someone's career really? That's it. Just goes back to this. Nobody can make your career. You got to make your own career. Yeah. If somebody <laughs> isn't giving you an opportunity, if someone, no one was giving us a job, so we worked together with a bunch of other creatives, created Culture Fest, and booked ourselves for a fat show. Next thing you know, people are booking us shows, and this is another thing. Oh, baby, you got me on a good one. Let's go. <laughs> Teddy talking today, family. Listen, if you don't bring anybody to the shows, how can you demand that you should be on shows? There are people putting their money into the show. They have to pay you at the end of the night. If someone's paying you $300 and you show up with four people and three of them are on the guest list, <laughs> how can you be like, this is, I'm not getting my love. Man, if you pull up with 50 people as an opener, I guarantee you, you will blaze through this scene. If you literally have 50 people that those other acts would not have brought, if it wasn't for you and your energy, you will zoom right through the scene. But people be showing up with not developing the work and doing, again, legwork. When I do shows, what do I do, bro, when a show comes? I hit you direct, don't I? Yeah. I hit you with a video message. Hey, bro. I need you there, man. So tell me about meetings for Mix a lot, and that that, that seemed that seemed crazy, it seemed fulfilling a little bit. Yeah, man, I've been having a lot of those moments lately, and again, like Mix was a wealth of knowledge. It wasn't anything too wild. Uh, they offered me. I played a show up in Bellingham. There's a guy named Craig. He's super dope guy. We came up there, we rocked the show, and he asked me, "Hey, do you also do solo stuff? Because I'm working with Mix, and you know, we already have Grinch on the bill, but we'd love for you to open. It's just not really a band type vibe. Mm. So there you go. That's a reverse of what we were talking about earlier. Sometimes calls for a band, sometimes it doesn't. You right. know, and then so my drummer will just come DJ for me. He's not tripping. 
the rest of the people were in the crowd showing love. Oh, Matt can DJ? Yeah, the hospitality, (laughs) DJ hospitality. (laughs) Um, But uh, so, yeah, when I when I went there, it actually was really serendipitous because it aligned with this uh, Universal Hip Hop Museum project I was working on because uh, Gertie, Gertie got it, uh, connected me with this woman, Tina Tyler Marie or Tina Marie Tyler. And she's connected with the Universal Hip Hop Museum in the Bronx. Okay. And they're building this four story, like it's a hip hop museum dedicated straight to like from the inception of hip hop to 2022 and beyond. Like, Damn. it's beautiful. And when I went out there, I was thinking like, somehow I'm going to be in here, you know? And then the, it happened. Tina had a project. She's like, yo, I want you to host it. The day before I was supposed to go do it at Pike Place, it got rained out. And I was like, bro, why don't we just do it at the show? Because the videographer just happened to also be uh, Mix-A-Lot's videographer, A Rush. So Rush is like, all right, cool. Let's just do it. And so he asked Mix if he would be on it. So I interviewed Big C's from Mediums. I interviewed the Windbreakers, which is a dance crew from Bellingham. I interviewed Grinch, another Seattle legend. And then uh, Mix came. And, bro, I just sat with him. I maybe asked this man five questions. He was just going off and and dropping jewel after jewel and being so supportive and was like, bro, it's your turn, you know, like – protect your your creative process protect your the creations you make partner with a label leverage it and go and do your thing man and and don't let somebody tell you not to believe in yourself and not to pursue this thing at a high level and try to be financially and uh uh, business-wise successful i'm like baby got back right baby (laughs) got back buddy and he's still spitting Man, Mix got breath control for real, for real. <laughs> Going crazy. Rock the whole stage, man. This man's older. And he was rocking, talking about breath like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Okay, if I see him out here not missing a single word with his lyrics, no backtrack, I can't say, oh, I should be on this stage when I come to the show and people are <laughs> over their own song. Yeah. It's it's a lot of work that goes into this scene and you can't cheat the hemes. You can't? I'm not going to say it. There you can't cheat the hemes. <laughs> you got to say it. You can't cheat the hemes. There you go. Wow. Can't happen, bro. I feel I, I feel something changing. Now. Hey, look at <laughs> you just got buffer, bro. <laughs> so how did it feel to be in like the inter in the interviewer chair to like interview all those guys? It felt pretty good to be honest because I've been on this side of it yeah. so much that I know. Okay, hey, I'll just get a good question in, sit back, and let them fly. Yeah. And that felt really good. It also was cool because it prompted me to just think about interviewers a little bit differently like i appreciate y'all even more now because it's not easy work and you're also doing some hosting in between you're juggling other people's thoughts you're balancing while still trying to stick to an agenda of what you're trying to accomplish so again there's no shortcuts you really got to learn how to do this and do it at a professional level and then engage and do it consistently Mm -hmm. and so let's talk about the like the after it's crazy so like i feel like all of our interviews are almost like chronological Mm -hmm. you know like when I first you had you on the show, it was like closer to the beginning of the pandemic. The Chaz and Chop had already, and it was the day after Chaz and Chop had been taken down or something, or the day of, you know, and you're talking about like your experiences there. Then you're talking about you're about to go on a retreat. Came back from the retreat, released the album. We did a 12th and Pine album. And then now I feel like it's a, a, ton, a ton of time has settled where we can, I feel like, talk about like the after effects of 12th and Pine. Mm-hmm. I feel. It's a weird thing too, like how I say, like I feel like we haven't met each other that many times, but I feel like a connection with you, and I feel like I, I understand your message, and I feel like this is a good episode, to, you know, just clear the air on certain things. Mm-hmm. I feel that certain p- people felt like you were putting out too much positive energy during, uh, I guess, I guess you could call it jazz and chop, kind of like a crisis mode era. And you're putting out all this positive energy. How, how would you respond to that? That's just who I am, family. I'm going to show up authentically myself in every single space 10 out of 10 times. And there are some people, and I respect people's right to feel. That's a really emotional time, right? If you're grieving, you might not want to deal with positivity. I respect that. But there's people that come out there day in and day out, protesters that would come at the end of the night and give me hugs. And we would hug and cry together and say that this recharge station gave them the energy to keep coming in and coming back out there. And it's not like we were out there just happy-go-lucky doing things. One, our music all has a message on to- on topic. Two, every four or five songs we're stopping, giving somebody else the platform to come and speak who wouldn't typically feel comfortable yelling in a bowl 
bullhorn or screaming front lines or being pushed inside of a mosh pit. And then we're sending people into the protest with food, with water, telling people, hey, you know, come get off your feet. If we're going to sustain this, actually it has to be sustainable. And there's times where when Dan Gregory got shot, I'm on the mic navigating chaos, telling people, hey, calm down. This is what protests are about. And, and ambulances are flying in, but they're not going in unless they're police escorts. But we can't have a police escort go inside the middle. Like, bro, there's tear gas flying around and all this stuff. It's not some, oh, this is fun out here. Let's hang out. That's not the reality of the situation. We were bringing hope, just like Bob Marley's music, just like Bob Dylan's music, just like uh, uh, the fifes and the drums during the Revolutionary War. Yes, we were there to boost morale, but also for regimentation and communication. We're out there helping the bike brigade get from point A to point B. We're working with, uh, you know, the mutual aid staff to make sure they have what they need and their spirits are up so they can still out, be out there and passing out stuff. So I feel people are entitled to feel however they want to. I respect that. And it's on me as someone who is willing to be the focal point of people's energy whether it's misguided or not and it's authentic or not to say hey i accept that i'm going to still be myself i'm going to learn and grow and become the leader that hopefully is able to cast a wider blanket but at that moment our heads are spinning too and we're just trying to get involved and help in any way we can and then we undeniably did that yeah you know we weren't out there just during when chop was around we were out there when rubber bullets were flying bro national guard tanks really going down people running to me marshall these tanks aren't going to stop i'm like we're not finna stop either bro we're not about to stop either real deal tanks coming mm -hmm. rubber bullets flying around uh, police coming our band members get off the stage hold line in front of uh, uh police guards I seen it with my own eyes. Real, It wasn't it's life or death situations. People chose to be out there. So I respect people's right to feel how they want to feel. A lot of people don't get a chance to just sit down and talk with me. A lot of people weren't there to experience it firsthand. A lot of people only experienced it through the internet or what other people have told them. That's okay. Right. That's fine because my actions will prove over time what type of person, what type of character I have and the people around me have. And that's all it can be. I know what type of person I am and why I do the things that I do. But I'm also, again, not above making mistakes or moving too fast. Like, I'm an excitable person. I'm really learning on the fly. And CHOP was one of those things. And uh, the the getting the project and the message out there was one of those things. It's like, it's hard to do that even if you're not under pressure, even if it's not a protest album. Right. And that thing was a protest album. Not all our music is going to be like that. Now this, we're making this new music like it's going to get better and it physically feels better to i feel a burden of angst lifted off my shoulders when creating that type of music that music was made in a dark space that was therapeutic and we made for ourselves first and foremost to get that experience out of our bodies and processed you know so so it's a lot of stuff something i talked to uh with one of my previous guests koof knots christina lease they're dope they're koof knots is a hip-hop artist and they're like a duo christina lease is a, a violinist it's mm dope duo and their po music is mostly positive as well and we're talking about like how positivity can come come off as niche sometimes mm -hmm. do, you, do you agree with that yeah i mean it's just hard again we live in seattle we're getting rained on 24 7 it's very easy to go into a mindset of oh this sucks and once you allow that mindset to go from one reaction to the next reaction to the next reaction that's the lens of which you see the world so me personally i wake up don't look at my phone meditate stretch record some music then once i'm okay in my own zone then i'll look at my phone handle my social media stuff go to the gym get my body locked in in tuned go to basketball practice or go do some sort of creative endeavor, drink a smoothie, eat healthy. That all of this is intentional so that I have the energy to stay positive. I'm choosing to work on myself and embrace these hardships I'm having with my life by facing them head on with a positive attitude. I'm choosing to do that no matter how bleak, no matter how much death, no matter how much pain is around me. That's what I'm choosing to do no matter what. And there's not times there are times where, OK, maybe I might slip. But I built the habit. Habit is a being positive is a habit. It's a skill set. And I'm choosing that because the alternative for me had me spiraling out of control, had me out of shape, had me thinking dark thoughts. That was a crazy picture, by the way. When you feel before me? and after picture. Come of on, baby. Weight. You can't cheat the heaves, <laughs> dog. You really can't. But that's what all that stuff, you know, that was after we had finished 12th and Pine. 
And after we'd put it out and like, bro, all this stuff that you were saying, you know, it was getting to me. It's like I wasn't reflecting myself, the, how I felt inwardly. and I wasn't treating my body uh, with the type of image that I wanted to see from myself. And I didn't have the energy to exude the type of positivity I know I could have in these moments and really created an even larger impact and even wider umbrella of love that I want to cast out because I wasn't treating myself proper. Once I hit that switch of, okay, hey, I'm going to treat my temple as the most important thing, honor thy hymns, then pow yow, it's time to, I'm able to be this type of person in public because I do so much things behind the scenes to be able to charge up like a spirit bomb and just go up on the Funksgiving Neptune stage and just pow, pow, right in the kisser, buddy. Pow. Pow. <laughs> Right, the kisser. That's right? from Family Guy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. So, so tell me about this this TEDx Teddy talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Teddy had a great conversation. Most people don't like their ex. I love him. <laughs> great, great, great person. You know, great individual. <laughs> Shout out Teddy. Um, it was something wild because I think it was in the midst of all these different swirls that be coming my way and everybody Marshall they're saying this about you man they're saying this oh they're saying <laughs> I'm like sheesh all right tough day on Twitter buddy <laughs> I think I'm gonna go shoot some jumpers but uh I got this DM homie slid in my DMs Teddy I'm like oh he's lying this is some spam whatever slid back in the DM circle back I said oh whoa Teddy really <laughs> serious you know we'd love for you to come share your message um and uh, on you know Seattle's biggest stage and uh, we said yeah sure and then it was kind of this thing where they didn't know if they're going to do it virtually because of the new COVID de uh, Delta variant or if they were going to have people they ended up having like a half size audience which was great but I was kind of bummed I'm like dang I gotta do this virtually like on my computer like mm -hmm. no I want to be and feel it and so once uh, we went through the process had to do like six different Zoom meetings. So like, oh, what's this guy gonna say? They could say they could sense it in me. And uh, so I kind of sent him my outline and whatnot, and I left spaces to improv, but I did a lot of memorization. We played three different songs. We played uh, Real News, which talked about our experience being de depicted in the media, both by uh, CNN and Fox News, and neither one of them told the truth. And so we talked about where those things converge and converge media and why we came out there to even begin with is because Omari made a open call for leadership after being pepper sprayed for the third straight day. He's like, where are the leaders at? That's why I was even out there to begin with. And so we talked about that. We did CNN. Then we talked about, OK, uh, you know how music and changing the world and spreading love doesn't always happen on your terms. It can happen in a protest. It can happen in Duval, Washington on the jelly bean riding around past Confederate flags, still playing our music, bro. Still going ham, dog. And or, you know, that's how you got to run in. We, I want my world to change. I they were going exactly. Yeah, they were going ham in there, bro. <laughs> they were really like they were turning up to that. And then uh, we uh, talked about, uh, you know, your journey. Anytime you're on your journey, you're going to have people that are uh, have an adverse response to you living your purpose. And then we did our song Cleos, which is for the haters. Mm. And yeah, got to do it on the world's biggest stage, buddy. It felt so good. I was in the sky blue. Teddy Talk's red sky blue fit too. Custom, man. And is that out now? Uh, the TED Talk is coming out. We got, we got, we're talking to the big TED guy. Mm. They have this nice uh, YouTube subscription base. So, uh, you know, we're just aligning properly and it's going to yeah. drop on there. See, it's all about marketing. You got to yeah. understand what you're doing, family. And <laughs> that's why we had uh, Chase Fade with us. We had Sonny get, documenting the whole process. And then instead of me doing it and being like, Oh, I'm so excited that this just happened. Here goes all the content. Here goes all the content. We did it. We gave people the preview. And then when it really comes out and we need to get that, uh, you know, horsepower behind it so that it gains traction on this huge subscription base and gets out to the type of audience we know we really want to touch. We got to make sure we have that gas pack prepared and ready to drop. And so Chase Fade got him all right. I had my haircut. Jay Fox went crazy, put the TEDx in it. Got the yeah. Ted Dread all the way from Madeline by Nature. Pulled up just in time. Express delivery day before the TED Talk. And uh, it was just behind the scenes. 50 different people all working dead serious. And like it looked like a spaceship, you know. Uh, assistants coming to get you. And do you need tea? Okay, we're going to come get you in five minutes to walk you to another assistant. Okay, we're walking out stage left. It's not a joke team. Very, very serious. Yeah. Very, very serious. 
And so it's like, all right, now if I approach my day to day activities or my show at the Timber Room with that same type of tenacity I did TED Talks, now the scene is lively because they haven't seen somebody this pumped up and excited to live their purpose before in real life that also doesn't cheat the hemes, bro. I look the part, act the part, can rap the part, and I'm really hustling every single day. So that's what it's going to take to bust this thing open, this PNW portal to just zoom people all the way through it. And like, look, Shayna Shepard's doing it. You feel me? Eva Walker's doing it. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy James, Delvin Lamar, Oregon Trio's doing it. It's like you can't say it can't be done if these people are doing it. You just got to find your own way. What is your advice for people who want to do like a TED Ox? TED, not TED Ox, TEDx. Well, you got to go hard. You know, the people that there's a, a person and a team that chooses to pick the people. And you got to understand they're not going to Timber Room on a Wednesday night. They might be. You never know. That's why every time I'm on the stage, uh, some of the shows, like how I got on the Kraken thing, it was, you know, shout out Jay Fitty, uh, uh, Rhythm and Rhymes. He brought that back with Gifted Youngsters. And, you know, it's like a 60, 80, 100 person event or something like that. And some artists that just came off the TED Talk or just came off the Neptune, you know, they might be thinking like, oh, I'm not going to give this my all because it's not a big room or whatever. I went up there and snapped, dog, went as hard as I could on a DJ set. Afterwards, DJ Side just happened to be in the room, stopped to get a drink. He's like, yo, I want to play your song at the Kraken. I really like this one. Next day, my song's playing at the Kraken. Damn. You feel me? So you got to just go hard every day. You don't know what opportunity is going to come when. How many times do you hear a story like, yeah, I just walked into a bar and I saw that guy playing. And then years later, he was that. It's because they're projecting themselves and seeing themselves on larger stages, even when they're only in front of one person. So that would be my advice. Every time you get an opportunity, maximize it. And then you got to be consistent and you got to work hard and you got to develop something that's unique to you. And then if you have one fan, start with that one fan. You're in customer service. Treat that fan like the best fan you can. Once you get two fans, you try to treat those two best fans you can. Once you get 800 fans, 1,000 fans, you treat those fans the best you can. You're now in customer service because you want those people to keep coming back, buying tickets, buying merch, supporting you online and all that stuff. So you have to switch your mindset to a customer service mindset. Um, and then you got to be able to switch it back off to be able to be in a creative space. And it's a grind. And that's why musicians are always getting burnt out. Yeah. So much emotionally, so much mentally, and you're not getting paid really for it. You, it's like any other business. Most people, if they start a mom and pop business, they go to the bank, they get hundred thousands of dollars worth of loans and they pour another hundreds of thousands of dollars of sweat equity into it. That's what it's going to take. You have to put a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of sweat equity and actual money into your dream unless somebody comes and plugs. But no one's going to just come out of thin air. They don't owe you that. Maybe it happens. Maybe it doesn't. I'm not the wait around type guy. Yeah. Not for me, buddy. Let's circle back to the very beginning when you were talking about like I got kicked out of your house. Yeah. <laughs> so now it seems like you got your dad on board with you. How did how did that come to be? And Man. how is that relationship? Is it has it put toll on your relationship at all? Having him be part of your ooh, my bad, bro. No worries. He just dropped, dropped the, cap. the kombucha cap. Should I go no cap? I like living on the edge. No cap. No there cap. No cap. Um, so it really it put a strain on my whole family when when they kicked me out. Again, like I can't really blame them because I literally when I dropped out of school. I dropped out. I was telling people, I want to start a grassroots movement that can change the world. But again, I was rapping yoga pants. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, was, I wasn't thinking. That's what I'm saying. I'd be learning as I go. I learn by making mistakes. Yeah. And I learn by failures. A lot of the successes, those, don't, those are like, okay, that's what should be happening. The failures are like, okay, I need to correct behavior. So after about three or four years of living on my own and kind of having a very estranged relationship, uh, we kind of started bonding again over basketball because he was a basketball coach as well. Mm. And that was kind of our, that we would just talk about that. We wouldn't really talk about music. And he was, anytime we did talk about music, he was like, my pops, you know him, bro. He's a straight shooter. He's like, bro, you got to get in shape and you have to start doing this professionally. Like you're not taking it seriously, bro. You're out of shape and you're smoking too much weed. That's what you just tell me, you know, and a lot of artists, they don't want to hear that yeah. because the reason why you're smoking too much weed, the reason why you're eating the wrong stuff is because you're going through depression and you're trying to find ways to cope with how difficult it is to be a poor artist. That's why you're taking it out on yourself. And it wasn't until I started loving myself and I went through such traumatic things at CHOP that was like my pops really came into the fold because 
him and his family were heavily involved in the civil rights movement in Southern California. My uh, great cousin, Sagidi and Heishimu, they were a part of the US movement, which is kind of the counterbalance to the Black Panthers. And they went around all the country establishing black student unions on the cutting edge of this. They're actually the group responsible for starting Kwanzaa. And so wow. these are people that are in my family, lineage in my family, I actually was gifted the name Sagidi from Heishimu because uh, Sagidi passed. And so Sagidi... Uh, had this name and then Heishimu said I want Marshall I want you to have it because you're doing the same stuff we were doing um, in our protest during the Watts Rebellion so the Watts Rebellion came they said look we didn't have they didn't have all that fancy equipment right there we were going out there throwing hands with the police really they had billy clubs we had ours too you know mm. and they were out there fighting with the police four or five days in a row and so when my uh, uncle seen what we were doing he's like oh my gosh this is family business like Randy What's going on? Calls my pops. My pops like, man, this is wild. You know, Marshall's just sleeping on the band couch uh, and just going back down there because, bro, I just slept on their couch. You know, I'm like, I got to save money. I'll give you money when I can. But if for order us for us to really do this, like I was just sleeping on couches, you know, years yeah. doing this, bro, bouncing back and forth because my pops relationship was estranged because they were just like, if you're going to do it, you got to do it on your own because we don't necessarily agree with this choice. Right. When the chop stuff happened, I just asked my pops, like, bro, I need you down here to just survey, bro. He goes out, old man, in the midst of, I shouldn't curse. Sorry, Papa Randy. He's going to find me for that. I try not to curse in public, but he is an old man, you know? And he, uh, you got a swear jar up. with him? Huh? You got a swear jar with him, basically? Yeah, basically. <laughs> Anybody who's in the Papa Randy family, you know, when you're in public and you're trying to comport yourself, I want to be able to walk in every circle. There. That doesn't mean I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm I'm smart enough that I don't need to curse. I can use whatever words I want to to communicate what I got on my heart and in my soul. And I want to bridge all gaps. So I just try not to curse uh, in public because I'm that's what I'm trying not to do. So no pussy popping out here. Not for me. <laughs> not for me. For others. Oh, if man. that's how you, if that's how you get down, far be it from me to stop you. <laughs> but me personally, it, that, that's you're not gonna hear that come out of my. That mouth. is my favorite like rap phrase. I'm like, what the fuck does really? that even? It's just the most random thing. I'm not to the say. guy to ask. <laughs> I'm not the guy to ask. That's your next interview potentially. Um, but yeah, he came out there, risked COVID, all these other things, and he was just out there. He's really good at um, surveying situations. Right. And so when the shooting happened and everybody was running and all scared, I like looked at him and he looked at me like, "Hey, next play, next play, get on the stage. You know, get up there, contribute. Like, don't get scared, contribute." Coach mode. Exactly. And that's when I got on the stage and was like, you know, telling people, "Calm, don't get to somewhere safe, don't sprint." Like, just like Charleston, this is a reality of coming to protest. This is exactly what we're fighting for against these type of crazy mass shootings occurring. So if that's what's going on right now, can't panic now. We're really in it. Yeah. And like me saying that made like. Hundreds of people that were sprinting, like, slow down, get safe, and then handle the situation. And then once all that got handled, we went back to protesting. It wasn't like people just cleared out. So my pops was very instrumental in just, like, okay, adding that elder guidance and that experience because him and his family have already seen history is very cyclical. And so we can learn and gleam from the French Revolution, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, uh, from the civil rights era here. And we can predict what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, at least have a framework to work from. And so that's when we started, OK, Papa Randy Records, because he's the only one with good credit <laughs> around us, you know, and he's with it now. And that's how uh, my pops came into the fold. And I just know, like, all right, despite how I fight with my pops despite how much he gets on my nerves, he has my back. And he's never going to let somebody demean my value. He's never going to let somebody take advantage of me. And he's going to give me his best effort. So I might as well team up with my pops because that's not the reality of the music industry and the other people you're going to have around you. Yeah. And so our businesses feud, fuel into each other. And now we're in family business together. And it's really cool to see the work he's doing with buying back the block and investing in companies like A for Apple, where we were just at 23rd and Jackson, Catfish Corner, you know, Earl's Barbershop, he, Brown Girl Cooks. We're with all these major players that are a part of really buying back the block. And Randy's instrumental in providing the framework and allowing them and helping them to kick down these doors to gain that funding they need and the conversations they need to have to go back to these areas that have been gentrified and really make an actual impact in the city. 
And so to see my pops doing that inspires me. And he's like, bro, keep going. Do the same thing with your music. And so these now we're at the point where these two avenues are converging. And me and my pops really going back to back, bro. And it's a beautiful feeling. Uh, the whole family is supportive of me now. My sisters are, are proud of me now. I walk down the street. My neighbors are proud of me. Pop out the house. Marshall, great <laughs> job. You know, I walk down the street. People honking at me. Like, bro, I'm playing with house money. I already did more than I ever thought could really be possible with just really sticking to who you are and projecting it into the world and not quitting. Didn't does, quit. Does he sort of manage you? or He's my manager. And so anybody who works for us, they got to report to him. Yeah. So we have other team members and managers and we're actively ser searching to engage the next realm of the entertainment industry to be like, okay, there's a person we've never met in our life that it's their job to be a manager and they want to manage us. That's really the next step. Because we're impossible to manage, family. I cannot be managed. <laughs> I'm I'm just I'm flying off the wall. I want things done this way. I want it done like this. I want this that this happen. And I'm pushing anybody around me to excel and to and they're doing the same to me. So not everybody can handle that, dog. Sometimes I can't even handle that. But between my pops, Matt, and myself, and then all these other team members that are around, you know, contributing their energy, like, we're a lot to manage. Yeah. Yeah. And last thing. Mm-hmm. I feel like uh, this one comes the most from me. Mm -hmm. well, these are all my questions, but like this one's more of like a personal me asking you. Yeah. So like when we were going to, when talks of doing like a documentary, you know, and it, it didn't work out, mm -hmm. I felt like there was some unneeded pressure if we were going to go through with the documentary to put it out before the Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. Do you, what was your like, thinking behind like the Pulitzer did you deep down feel like that was something you're going to get yeah or were you building off what were you just building I mean, off the marketing look, it's or? just like a, a Grammy or something when you get nominated for a Grammy it's because you went through the processes that it takes to do that any person who ever wins a Pulitzer they have applied for a Pulitzer it costs $150 any person can apply for a Pulitzer not everybody knows that information but that's facts so then I was looking I'm like this is in the area of the civil rights era, the modern day civil rights era. Our album literally was cooked up on the streets. A lot of those songs were literally documenting what we saw. What other album and what other project what did that? Right. So, dog, I swear, the night before the Pulitzer, I slept like a baby. <laughs> I slept eight hours. I thought I was taking that thing home, bruh. Had the champagne next to me, bro. I really thought, like, there is no way after all these things that we've been through and the way it's been documented and the evidence that we're putting into what we really lived, that this isn't something that this committee that is, because I also studied Joseph Pulitzer. He was a media guy that was the first guy to create 3D print. He was he was a guy who would run his own Merrill uh, ads in his uh, own print, you know? So I was like, oh, he has this type of spirit. This is Joseph Pulitzer's spirit, is to use a platform to create a bigger platform right i thought we had it bro on everything and so i know with that documentary specifically like i'll say it, it's like you know the interviews were on zoom it was good stuff yeah. but like it wasn't what like you're doing now and it wasn't the level of professionalism that i felt we needed to really catapult us into the next genre and i know like my pops he doesn't my pops is not one for tact family He's like LeVar Ball type dude, bro. <laughs> like he's really, he's an old man. Everybody has parents. Think how awkward it would be if your parent was just out here talking to your friend and you're not around and they like say like, oh, why you say this? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I know my pops has my back. So I would rather have to mend relationships on the back end and be like, yo, that's my pops, bro. Like, what do you want from, what do you want me to do? Tell my pops <laughs> to shut up, you know? And have people understand us and our dynamic for who it is, then go around and not have a person like that in my corner, you know? And so he was one that was like, bro, don't sell yourself short. You're really running in the legacy and the race of other people before you. And you did that stuff in real time. It's not easy to make an album. It's not easy to write songs, arrange songs, go into the studio, crank them out. Yeah. And I really felt like we deserved it. And now I'm going to submit this TED Talk for the Pulitzer <laughs> round two, buddy. Every year of my life, I'm going back at it until I get one. Hell yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, it, it's what any, um, any platform, usually typically they're used to the artists 
bringing the platform shine. I use the platform to bring the artist shine. Mm. People don't like that when artists empower themselves. But nothing's finna stop this, buddy. You gotta talk with Ted. I didn't know I was finna talk with Ted after that. But who knows? That could have been the stepping stone that opened the door. I don't know. Right? So I'm just gonna consistently keep showing up, knocking on doors when people don't let me in. I'll apply and get in. But I still got in that mug. Yeah. Didn't win, but I was still in there. And that's what it's about, bro. They're gonna have to bring names up now. They're gonna have to, when you talk about the conversation, you talk about the P and portal and this region, they gotta bring names up now. And that's a fact. Teddy's talking with him. And I'm talking with my boy Blake. Gave him my flowers. You feel me? There Had to give go. my guy his flowers. You <laughs> earned them, bro. Thank Congratulations, you. Congratulations, man. man, on all you do, bro. And, and thank you for having me, bro. This was awesome. Of course. Is there anything else you want to promote before we get out of here? Uh, when's this coming out? Probably either tomorrow or Monday. Oh, you're quick. You're about to go in yeah. the dungeon, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, we did we did a pretty good job. Won't take too much editing or yeah. none at all, huh? Uh yeah, well then the gala, Emerald City Gala, this is all centered around um uh annual donation we do with Cozy Connections. They've done it for the past 12 years. This is 5 years in a row of me doing a December to remember and us as a band and as a collective and our friends getting involved and having it just expand of uh, using events to gather donations. And then on Christmas day, we go out and di directly give these donations to the people most affected, got haircuts going out there with ready Ron uh, conscious eatery is going to have a bunch of free food for everybody down there. We'll have uh, backpacks, jackets, warm coats, shoes, uh, and just put a smile on people's face. That's my new Christmas tradition for the past five years. That's but awesome. the Emerald city gala is with our chance to, party with a purpose and it gives you a reason to really dress up like people got to come fly i cannot repeat this enough come to drip do not come just with your regular fit on i'm actually coming this time i think and you too. are yeah don't give your yeah. ticket to nestra nestra can still come <laughs> but don't give your ticket away to any of our shows again buddy. Uh, you gotta carve out the time my g that was offensive my g i came out to black panther at the at the gala oh man a 2019 came out to the song black panther this ain't new stuff <laughs> There ain't no new stuff happening over here, Blake. Come on, buddy. But anyway, yeah, come fly. Uh, there's an artist mixer prior to at Life on Mars. We're going to like, we're listen, we're going to lose money doing this event to prove that we should build community and that these people are worth it. And eventually we'll get more sponsors and they'll be the ones putting up the money. But until that day comes, we're putting up our own money to get limos to and from Life on Mars so the artists feel appreciated. We're going to get, you know, you can't pay everybody a ton, bro. We're not making any money off of this, but we're going to pay everybody, you know, and make sure people get pictures, make sure people get media. Shout out now's podcast is gonna be there down go. you feel yeah. me make sure people feel special and dressed up and valued as a contributor we're not the hired help the seattle music scene is not the hired help for people's causes right. we really have to do so much and sacrifice so much the least we can do is feel and appreciated when we walk into spaces and so you know dick's cheeseburgers we're gonna have cheeseburgers for people and we're gonna make people feel appreciated everybody that was a part of that and everybody who walks through that door is going to feel appreciated in some some regard and yeah. that's the gala going on and then as soon as we do our christmas uh give back we're gone bro we're going to hawaii man we got a whole tour set up we're writing some more music finishing up the second album and then it's, it's tour season bro it's really time to engage that next stratosphere jump through the pnw portal go intergalactic bro just out of here go to gonna go europe gonna go uh new zealand gonna go to japan damn you know new york already went there he already went to austin already went to anchorage already went to la like bro it's really about to pop off and we got a story to tell now and a platform to tell it from like my boy at the nice podcast Hell yeah. buddy teddy talk i'm happy we did this man what's the easiest way for people to reach you uh you just go to tedtalk.com no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just look for Teddy, a big Teddy walking around, man. And you'll see him. Marshall Hugh, Marshall Law Band. We out here, baby. There we go. This is the NAS podcast with Marshall Hugh, aka Mr. Fresh Off a Plane, aka Teddy talking again, baby. There we go. And we did it.